This is going out on December 5th. So you're probably expecting something like Exodus or what is it, Top 5? Yeah. Somewhere in that area. Sorry. <laughs> well, yes, obviously, for obvious reasons, uh, you won't be getting those quite yet. So I'm giving you these three kind of throwaway movies in the event that you would have missed me if I was gone a week. I'm at Reunion right now, having fun. So there. I'm in Florida. That's the reason why you're getting these videos. And, real quick before we get started, there are some Oscar movies that you'll be watching while I'm gone that we're going to put on video when I get back. Stuff that people want to see that are not necessarily contenders anymore, but they used to be. Some of them are, some of them are not, so... We'll see. Including one that you're putting a lot, a lot of stake in right now. <laughs> Well, okay, we'll in, the main, the end of the video. in the meantime, um, these are three movies that kind of got really small releases recently and pretty much nobody saw them, so I'm going to go ahead and throw them out there. Whether they're worth talking about or not, uh, you'll find out. <laughs> Our first one is Jezebel, because we're not quite done with horror movies yet. There was a trailer for this on the Quiet Ones, I want to say. I believe so, yeah. And then it was never attached to anything again. Nope. And it ended up not even getting a wide release. It got a really small release. Uh, but I still managed to lay eyes on it. So, it starts, and our main actress is an, uh, an actress named Sarah Snook, who I like calling Australian Emma Stone. Yeah, I can um, see that. <laughs> and she's with her boyfriend, and um, she's got something brewing in here. And they're getting ready to leave. And, you know, move in together because they're a happy couple. Um, and then their car gets hit by a truck. And he dies and she gets paralyzed and loses the baby. So for the rest of the movie, she's in a wheelchair. Um, and has to be cared for, for her by her dad. So her dad takes her out to their old house that's basically in this gothic horror swamp setting. Um... Where she finds, um, her mom had died of cancer before she was born. So she never knew her, so she's just kind of wandering around this house. And, um, I felt like I was watching Curse of Chucky again with a creepy house and a horror movie and the main character is confined to a wheelchair. <laughs> um, you know, not, not like Rear Window or anything like that. She's much more mobile than that. Um, and... Obviously, uh, well, she finds uh, these tapes that her mom had made that's kind of like, you know, hey, you know, the, this is me talking to you even though I'm dead now, stuff like that. Um, and then eventually uh, she starts getting harassed by a ghost, naturally. Um, and that's pretty much what this movie is. Um, it's worth noting that Robert Ben Garant from... Reno 911, is it? Yes, I know from the state. Is the screenwriter. Um, seemed to be nobody else's idea. He didn't have a co-writer, just he's the sole writing credit. Um, now, as far as... Um, okay, to give this movie credit immediately, as much as I can, um, it's not like... We've had so many bad, bad, bad horror movies this year. Oh, yeah. Just really unbearably horrible horror movies, just seemingly nonstop. Um, this doesn't quite reach that level or anything. It doesn't do a lot of those annoying things. It's got, you know, it's got, like, the cheap jump scares and stuff like that, but it doesn't have many. And it is, it does seem to be doing its best as far as trying to go for creepy atmosphere. Um... But still, um, and, but the problem here is, um, there's really not a lot to be scared about. Like the, there are a couple of scenes that kind of are a bit, you know, catch you by surprise or, or are chilling. Like, there's one particular scene where one of the scares is kind of, it's one of those, you know, building scares, it's not a jump scare or anything, but, um, she's sleeping in what I guess was her mom's bed, and this is one of those beds that has, like, you know, the the curtain around it. Oh, yeah. Um, and she kind of sees... She keeps feeling like she's seeing something approaching her through that, but she can't see clearly. And, of course, you know, she always pulls it back and there's nothing there and shit like that. Um, that that's kind of effective, and it, it probably would, you know, if for some reason I was sleeping in one of those beds that had one of those, I probably would not, you know, 
<laughs> I'd probably get rid of the fucking thing. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there's one scene towards the end where something kind of takes you by surprise, but it's very brief and mildly effective. Everything else is... As far as, st not so much the scares, because it doesn't rely on, you know, the cliches as much as a lot of movies have lately in this genre. But, um, story-wise, and the way things are executed, and the twists and turns, everything still feels a bit like other movies have done this before, and it's still just kind of following that pattern. Um, there was, I won't say it because it's a spoiler, but... When me and you would talk about this movie, uh, before I saw it, there was a particular horror movie I kept comparing it to. Mm -hmm. And it and that movie actually have very similar endings, too. Hmm. So, <laughs> if you want to continue to make that comparison. Um, but, you know, and it, and it also kind of doesn't really reveal its twists and turns that great. Because... There's a moment where we realize that um, it, there's there's always the big revelation before the big climax starts to happen. Um, the big reveal in this movie is one of those things where it's something that most likely could have been revealed much earlier than it was. So it kind of, when you look back on it in retrospect, makes a lot of the movie just kind of feel like padding. And the movie's only an hour and a half anyway. Hmm. Um, the big mystery that comes to be... Um, it turns out she very easily could have solved if she just kind of did things a little quicker. <laughs> um, so there's that. Um, I'm not... I'm sure she's an okay... I haven't seen her in that many movies. I saw her in an Australian movie called um, Not Suitable for Children that she was alright in. Um, but apart from that, I don't really know... I haven't watched Predestination yet. But... Um, so I'm not exactly sure on her talents as an actress, but if I were to have just seen this, I wouldn't think very positively. She's not... I don't, I don't know if it's the writing of the character or what, but this isn't exactly a strong leading horror performance, um, which probably could have totally benefited at least a little more from one, but uh, we didn't really get that either, so... If you, like, if horror is really, really your thing, and you'll pretty much just kind of eat up anything in the genre, even if, even if you know, even if you're one of those people where, like, you know it's, you know, not very good, but you just love the genre so much, you'll just, you know, it'll be alright to you. I, I could probably see genre fans taking to it fine. They won't love it, but they won't think it's too bad, I don't think. Um, it hits those familiar notes that, you know... We'll keep fans of the genre interested enough, but overall it's pretty unsatisfying when you look at it in a grander spectrum, so. Um, yes, that's what Jezebel is. So, okay. Our next movie has an interesting connotation to go with it because we are, man, this is really sad to say, I didn't really think about it until just now, coming out of my mouth. Um... We are getting closer and closer to the very end of Robin Williams' filmography. Yeah. Um, and right before Night at the Museum, we have this. Um, right after The Face of Love and The Angriest Man in Brooklyn. It's interesting you put them together because Ben Duran obviously helped Tom Lennon write Night at the Museum, so... Yeah. Um, this is A Merry Friggin' Christmas, which stars uh, Joel McHale and Lauren Graham as a married couple, and they have a couple of kids. One of those kids is the kid from Looper, which was in, who was in something recently, but I forget what it was, because I called him the kid from Looper then, too. Um, and they are um, going away to spend... Because what happened is um, Joel McHale has a brother, played by Clark Duke, and Clark Duke has had a child, and he's going to... Um, there's going to be like a christening or a baptism or whichever one. Um, I think it's a baptism, actually. <laughs> um, so everybody has to come into town. Uh, but the issue is, is that uh, the baptism is going to be on Christmas Eve. And Joel McHale and Robin Williams, who plays his father, are very estranged because um, he was a shit dad. 
he was basically, you know, at a, he was an alcoholic and he wouldn't, you know, let him pursue the things he really wanted to do. His main passion was to paint pictures of B. Arthur um, <laughs> and make tables out of them. But um, Robin Williams was basically very against everything that he did. And so there's always been this heat between them. So the last, and Joel McHale is all about Christmas. He's like, you know, yes, bring on the presents, make everything great. He's absolutely bound and determined to make sure that his son does not stop believing in Santa Claus to keep the magic alive. Um, so the very last thing he wants to do this Christmas is suddenly be spending it with his dad. Um, so they get there and, you know, family hijinks ensue. There's, there's this ongoing joke where, um, the kids in the family like to have eating contests, um, which is just put in there for filler later. Um, the movie's like an hour and 13 minutes when the credits start. <laughs> it's really, really pushing its run time. Um, long story short, uh, we actually get to the plot like over half an hour in, in an 80 minute movie. Um, what happens is they make the whole trip down. It's like a whole, you know, I think it's like a four hour round trip, they said. Um, but what happened is they're getting ready. It's Christmas Eve. They're getting all the presents out. And they realize that this is not going to be the perfect Christmas. And he's going to have a lot of trouble convincing his son that Santa exists because they forgot his presents at home in the closet. So he says, well, there's no way around this. I have to make the trip and go back home to get them. And so Robin Williams says, okay, I'm coming with you for some reason. Um, so estranged father and son who can't spend two minutes with each other without fighting get in a car together and take a trip on Christmas Eve. Do you think maybe, just maybe, they'll come to, you know, an agreement and they'll let out their emotions and they'll be happy and Christmas will be wonderful for everybody? Um, while watching these, you know, terrible people do their thing. Yes. And there's also a side plot we keep cutting back to for filler, where, um, Candace Bergen, I think, plays the mom. Yes. And her and Lauren Graham are in the attic going through things. They're trying to find old things in the attic to give the kid for Christmas, so he doesn't think that Santa didn't come. Um, now, there's a lot of things wrong here. Let me start off immediately with this. Um, does anybody remember my, uh, my worst of the year video last year that we did? Oh, I'm sure they do. I talked about a movie called All is Bright mm -hmm. with Paul Giamatti and Paul Rudd. It was about the two most despicable people you could possibly think of working together to sell Christmas trees, and it was an abomination of a fucking movie. Um, while it's not as bad as All is Bright, um... I was, I, there were scenes where I felt like I was watching that movie again. It <laughs> felt a lot like it in places. Um, there's rarely a joke that works. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but I remember thinking a couple of times, okay, that's kind of funny. Uh, <laughs> um, they're doing that thing again, okay. Um, I really hate that this was the end of his career because for a lot of reasons, but particularly um, this and The Angriest Man in Brooklyn did the same thing. For some reason, when we got to the end here, people kept casting Robin Williams as some outbursting asshole that just hated everything about everything. And he was really unconvincing in those roles. There and here. And the Anderson of Brooklyn and in this. Um, and like I pointed out in that review, um, he can play angry and hateful really, really well. Yeah. But for some reason in these comedies, it just comes off really weird and just not in any way true to anything and i think it's just it's it's not him it's miscasting is absolutely what it is um and that's all because they don't even try to make him funny they cast robin williams and the character's not even really supposed to be funny he's just supposed to be a massive douchebag which begs the question, where's the comedy coming from? Because Joel McHale is kind of playing the straight man, too, in regards to his crazy family. You have fucking Tim from Tim and Eric, and that's doing some bullshit. And Clark Duke is supposed to kind of be the big comedic part. I don't... That, no. No. 
his deal is he was in like the war, but he fell off a truck and got a head injury, and now he's like all fucked up before he even did anything major. And now he like screams and runs out of the room when there's drama, and he ends up accidentally um, stowing away and they're on their trip, and then it's the three of them. This character keeps popping up in random places. It's a homeless Santa played by Oliver Platt. Um, I didn't even know it was him until about halfway through, because he's covered by the beard and just looks all ratty and shit. Hmm. Um, and he's kind of, you know, this personification of the real Santa, even though he's a homeless bum Santa. Whatever. There's this really pointless, prolonged scene that has a really obvious payoff where... They run him over and they think they've killed him and he wakes up when they're getting ready to try to dispose of his body in different ways. That whole thing. The thing goes all the way back to Scary Movie, at least. Um, no, hardly anything works about this movie. So much so, like I said, I remember there are a couple of lines in there that I thought were kind of funny. But I struggle to remember them now. All I remember is what I didn't like about it, which was about an hour and ten minutes of its hour and thirteen minute runtime. So, that's a bummer. Okay, our last movie is very interesting. Um, our last movie is called Miss Meadows. Miss Meadows stars Katie Holmes as a substitute teacher. Uh, we're talking like kindergarten and first grade. Hmm. Um, and she, she dresses in those little dresses and stuff like that. And she has one of those little Miss Perfect attitudes. And she wears, um, like tap things on the bottom of her shoes so she can tap dance to work. And she tap dances around the house while she does the little perfect things. But it just so happens that Miss Meadows is also incredibly mentally unstable. And she carries a gun in her purse to kill rapists, pedophiles, and murderers. At any glance. The very opening scene of the movie um, kind of kind of gave me serial mom vibes. Sounds like it. Um, which made me really happy at first because um, she's there, she's reading a book while she's walking to school and she's tap dancing and then a dude pulls up in a truck and is trying to get her in so he can basically rape her and then finally he pulls a gun on her and then she pulls the gun out of her purse and just blows him away, and then just continues to skip down the street. Um, with some really weirdly put in CG animals like deer and birds and shit, just to add to the perfection of her world. Um, that's the opening scene. <laughs> the trouble with that is I really got hooked on the idea that this was going to be like a serial mom kind of black comedy. Um... And, and there are some darkly comedic things in there, like just her attitude in general, and then um, there's like, there's a humorous but weird sex scene in there with her and James Badgedale, who is a cop that she falls in love with. Um, who, of course, you know, since he's a cop, he will gradually, maybe, may or may not, start hunting the vigilante that's been offing pedophiles and rapists, Of course. Et um, but the trouble is, is as this movie goes on, and once it gets past its opening, um, it stops being a black comedy and just turns into a really, really weird thriller. Like, it goes almost completely serious in the last hour. Um, and I found that a bit off-putting, because I thought there was really something to be had here if you just went full on with the dark comedy approach. And just made it, like, super over-the-top, like Serial Mom, for instance. Um, but it starts to, like, ground itself in realism and tries to be really disturbing and weird. And uh, it was just weird. I still think I like the movie, but I'm not quite sure. I might like it more in, like, retrospect later, but... Because I just kind of had to get used to what the movie actually was to, as to what I thought it was. But still, it really set itself up for something that it kind of turned into something else entirely. So that was a bit off-putting. Um, I'm not particularly fond of Katie Holmes' acting, maybe occasionally. Um, but here, I thought she was really, really good. Apparently, she's gotten some iffy reactions, but I thought she was totally convincing. And it, it's a really, really complex character, too. Because she has to be funny, she has to be dramatic, 
She has to have, you know, big scenes. She has to be kind of tender because she works with children. But at the same time, she has to be kind of scary because there's clearly something wrong with her. But we don't really quite... We, it's kind of hard to tell what it is. Without saying too much, there's kind of a cool twist with about 20 minutes to go that I never saw coming. And me even saying that probably isn't a spoiler because even if you like kind of expect a small little twist in there, I don't think you're going to realize what it is until it happens. <laughs> um, so I found that really effective. And it rings true too. Like it totally works in, as far as how they set it up to begin with. So that was unexpected and interesting and added a whole new layer to the movie. So, yes, it's a, it's a weird-ass movie, but on principle alone, it's worth checking out. If you're really, really curious. <laughs> um, it's worth it, at least for that, in my opinion. So, yeah, that's just a quick 21-minute thing here. Okay, star mounts. So, we've got Jezebel. Um, two. A Merry Friggin' Christmas? One and a half. I'll Miss be generous. Miss Meadows. Two and a half. Real quick, um, this is not the last you'll hear of Robin Williams, and I'm not talking about Ninth Museum 2 either. We're actually planning a, a nice little versus month for Robin Williams, mm -hmm. and we're going to finally do the Robin Williams tribute video. Um, the, the verses in that might be kind of, you know, the same thing a little bit, because that's a lot to take in, but we'll figure that out as we go. Sounds good, and uh, when I come back, we've got, it sounds like we've got Mr. Turner, and still Alice, and the Holmesman, and Maps of the Stars, on top of stuff like Exodus, and Top 5, hopefully, and hopefully. looking forward to stuff like Foxcatcher, and Big Eyes, and The Imitation Game, there's a lot of stuff we've got to come out soon, hopefully we'll get it, so, there's always that. Continue to watch the Disney and Universal content. I'm actually going to be going over to Universal on Monday. I may be going there Sunday uh, if everything works out. I'll be at Disney for the next couple days for reunion. And, of course, we've got a brand new Versus coming at you. And uh, what happens in Vegas is what we're going to talk about. That's your... Uh, figure out what, what I mean by that. You probably know at least one. So yeah. what am I? what is it taking on is the question. So that's coming at you, and uh, more content here, more sip and snacks, more vlogger randomness, more content here on Pop. Stay tuned. So, uh, AJ, any parting words?